Hey everyone, it's John Reed of Diginomica. I've got my podcast partner, Prime, back with me. Brian Summer, how are we doing? Oh, you know, I'm going squirrely with all this uh, self-isolation kind of stuff, but otherwise, okay. Yeah, the last time you and I saw each other in person was uh, Texas Barbecue Zoho Analyst Day. It almost seems like a different world back then. Oh, um, man. I'm tasting brisket right now. <laughs> you say that. Uh, yeah. you know. mm. We're here today because despite the fact that we're bunkered down, I think one of the really big themes coming out of this is that waiting until you have a full answer to the current business environment is a huge mistake. In that spirit, Brian sent me an outline that is long enough for 10 podcasts, I think. We're going to see what we can do. And Brian, one of the things that I think is really important here is, is there historical precedence? In other words, can we apply some lessons to the past situation? And specifically, you've done some thinking around the recession in 2008. Do you think there's some lessons yeah. there? Like how, how relevant is that to the situation when we're in now? Well, I'm old enough to have gone through a bunch of recessions in my lifetime. Painful one for me, obviously, was the 2001 Y2K bubble burst and the end of the dot-com kind of uh, you know explosion. That was yep. amazing. Uh, and then there was the one in 2008, 2009, uh, the Great Recession, and that's the one that happened when um, it all started with subprime mortgages and collateralized debt obligations on Wall Street. And before you know it, it was taking down the auto industry and financial markets all over the world. So what we saw coming out of those uh, were rather interesting. In uh, the Great Recession, capital got tight. Companies started hoarding cash, and it restricted spending all over the place. And in particular, an area that got highly restricted was spending around discretionary technology. In other words, if I'm a CIO, I'm going to try not to have to buy a bunch of new uh, desktop computers, servers. I'm not going to buy any or sign off on any um, purchases and implementations of back office technology because any place where I've already got a package, I don't need to spend money to go do a packageectomy and replace it again. When you when those sales dry up, then you saw a corresponding elimination of all the services that went along with those kind of uh, implementations and agreements. So, yeah, there's a lot, and we're going to see a lot of that same kind of thing happen right now. One of the obvious differences is, and that I've been documenting a lot is just the impact on remote workforces, and and we don't we don't know for sure how much of that is going to change on a permanent basis, right? Like. Uh, powerful shifts towards uh, digital commerce, towards online events, all the different things that are happening that force changes due to so-called social distancing. I think that's addition, additional layer. Starting to see some patterns here in terms of what companies are doing, and we have some data points as well to discuss. Brian, you, you're talking about the back office being adversely impacted as one of the first first areas. Tell us more about that. A lot of the back office kind of stuff like finance and HR and, you know, all the stuff that goes with it for rather traditional kind of transaction systems, payables, fixed assets, ledger, payroll, whatever. There's just not going to be any urgency or appetite for people to change them out. Worse, in some industries, you're going to find uh, like in airlines, hotels, cruise lines, and we go, uh, restaurants and so forth. Uh, they, their business could be off 50, 75, 100 percent from what it was, uh, you know, a year ago. Uh, so they, obviously, they don't need any new software uh, when they have no business and no revenue coming in. I mean, for them, uh, their number one priority is a fight for survival or business continuity. Uh, the, you know, anything else from IT's perspective to go switch out some of these kind of, you know, do a packageectomy, pop an old ledger out, put a new one in. It's just not a priority right now. The other thing I think is kind of interesting, you know, it's looking at where are people spending their time. I've had a lot of phone calls lately with uh, finance and accounting professionals at large companies. And uh, in the large firms, there is no bandwidth for finance people to help out with any kind of an app. Uh, that affects their area. I, I'll tell you that straight up. Not only are they getting adjusted to little quirks that are popping up trying to work from home while they're trying to close the books and prepare for you know their year-end audit, which is coming up for a lot of firms now, and they got Q1 books to get done, but they also are trying to figure out, like, do we qualify as a company to get any kind of bailout money? And if so, who's going to pull together paperwork for that? Number two is 
some of our stock, some of the investments we have took such a hit on the stock price fluctuations lately on the stock exchanges. They're having difficulty trying to revalue what some of their assets are, and they're trying to make determinations whether they're still in uh, alignment or compliance with some of their loan uh, covenants and other aspects. They also have some, a neat problem, if you want to call it neat. They've got work from home uh, stuff that's now exploded on them, and it now puts them having almost uh, a, high, uh, a very large number of workers in tax jurisdictions they weren't in uh, before in some cases. And that may create new tax nexus issues for companies. And the finance departments are just pulling their hair out trying to, if you will, just tread water with all the dynamic things that are hitting them right now. You put in this note in our podcast thing, and I was just thinking about like, that's brutal, right? Because now you have to fire people over video, like, ugh. Yeah, that is a terrible way to find out your no, your services are no longer needed when you, you're on a con call with a thousand other people on Zoom and all of you are getting pink slipped. Talk about an engagement nightmare there. So, uh, you know, we're all having to do what we have to do, and we're all having to do things for the better good of um, the, the global society, and, and that's the right thing. I, you know, there's no question about that. It's just it creates some really uncomfortable kind of decisions. Right now, companies are having to reprioritize what is important for them. And I think the top priorities are going to be, one, business continuity is number one. Two, it's some level of like stabilization of things before they start running off and taking on new you know, challenges. Uh, and then and only then, once things finally hit bottom and start turning around and moving up, then you might well see um, – organizations starting to make new investments and uh, prepare for the future uh, the, uh, world that they're going to be operating in. The biggest thing that's disappointed me is, is vendors that have kind of gone quiet. To me, that's the absolute wrong thing right now. When I was talking with ASUG, the SAP user group, and they were saying, like, how are your customers, your members dealing with this? And this was very early on. This was like a month ago. And they had been having these online birds of a feather gatherings where they basically just pulled together bunch of CIOs or CMOs, whatever your job role was, and just put people together and said, you know, let's talk about what we're dealing with right now. And I love that because it was like, you don't have to have all the answers right now, right? Like part of it is just starting the discussion and, and not being afraid to make that call. I talked to one CEO was like, I think some folks are afraid to call their customers right now. And he talked about, you know, he, he had to call a customer that was a high fashion retailer in New York City, right? <laughs> and, you know, their business is a disaster, right? now right but that call had to happen and they had to have a conversation and start discussing like how can we help you how can we keep this relationship going couldn't agree more i think the communicating with customers is job one now we have another interesting aspect of this right which is just really understanding the industry predicaments and and obviously every recession has you know there's going to be some industries that, that do better than others but i think this one is particularly striking right in terms of the the obvious impact and Trust Radius uh, sent us some, you and I, some data that they had recently collected. They've been doing monthly and then some weekly updates from their user base. They had a couple thousand respondents on the industry breakdowns. Industries that are expanding software spend include government administration up at 38, nonprofits at 25, telecom at 25, insurance at 23%, education 24 And now that doesn't necessarily mean that all those industries are totally healthy right now, but it means that there's an imperative, like they, they argue they're probably telecom and education are increasing spending because of the, the demand for, for remote access and such. Um, and then, of course, when you talk about the uh, industries that are reducing all software spend, the result should surprise no one. 40% of all respondents in retail, hospitality, marketing, and advertising, oil and gas are all reducing spend. Half of retail respondents are reducing spend, which, of course, indicates that not all retailers are impacted in the same way. Some are doing a lot better than others. And then of course, 64% of hospitality cutting spending. So that, that kind of presents a framework for it. It's kind of a logical way to understand this, but I think where you and I find this interesting is obviously that even within an industry, there's certain kinds of software that's going to be a lot more viable to move ahead with and certain kinds of projects 
that are going to surge, whereas others are going to lag. So I'll give you the first blush reaction on, from me on that. I think everyone knows right now there's been a giant uptake in technologies like Zoom and collaboration and remote access and terminal emulator kind of technology. Everybody you know that's in those spaces has seen uh, a big initial surge in that kind of uh, activity, and that's all because of the immediacy of uh, work from home that drove that. Let's get past that point. What's going to happen next and is your start I'm already getting phone calls from folks who are telling me about we need a better way to close our books than uh, ha- you know the idea of working with tons of spreadsheets and moving stuff around <clears throat> from person to person might work in an office where you can holler at somebody and go, "Hey, I'm sending you the spreadsheet, pull it up and fix something." It's a little harder to do that when everyone's scattered all over the you know, the uh, the four corners of the earth trying to do it. And so some of these, the next round, I think will be in these super process automation tools, things like, uh, say, what Blackline or Flowcast, or whatever can do to help companies like rapidly close books and deal with uh, all the intercompany and exception handling and everything else. You'll see it, I think, I think you'll see increased interest in some of the like uh, automated pay, uh, payables kind of processing technologies because doing if work has to be done ever more remotely or uh, what if anyone's smart and paying attention they're going to realize that there are big cracks in the way processes work when you throw on top of it the remote work that uh, aspects of how things have to work going forward so I think we're going to see some process automation technologies probably really come into the fore as one of the next future waves to pop up. Uh, and that, that also means that some of those tools, some of the best process automation tools have machine learning technologies underneath them. And, and some of them will drag chatbot and other kind of technologies along with it as well. So I, again, I, I just don't think we're going to see a, an overnight renaissance of uh, new sales in you know double entry accounting. No, what we'll see are things that are going to uh, dramatically change processes. I think that's one of the areas we'll see uh, the next big uplift occur. I do hear from certain cloud vendors that are in heavy demand right now for various things. I talked with support.com last week and they're hiring right now and they're trying to ramp up more remote cloud-based support that includes, like you said, chatbot automation technologies, and in some cases, humans on the other side of that working remotely as well, as companies have had to scramble because they were using centralized call centers. A lot of those aren't aren't viable right now due to our social distancing problems. So problem that I have is, and where I get a little worried, when you rush to an immediate purchase without a framework, because the one thing I would argue should never change now is that you should still have a coherent view of of the future as far as what kind of data platform do you want to have in the future? What hyperscalers are you going to work with and under what terms? Which types of IT resources are you going to cultivate? Like, I don't think that really changes just because you're in a predicament right now. I still think you have to make good decisions and not just, you know, install point solutions that are going to help you with one pain point right now, like closing the books. It all still has to integrate in the long run. On this call, you're going to have companies who are across every level of like, uh, let's call it the Maslow hierarchy of technology pain right now. We've got some companies who their economic condition is such that they worry about the physiological needs at the bottom. Do we even have enough cash to make payroll next month? And if they have to do something quick, cheap, and dirty, even if it's a spreadsheet kind of, um, you know, cut and, you know, kind of uh, app they build, I understand that because their business viability is at risk. There are some others that are just, um, you know, they, they're keeping a mind, they're, they're functioning and they're functioning okay. Uh, they just want to be very careful about how they spend their cash. Uh, but they need to get all the cautions you just brought up, which is you need to have a plan. And as a guy who just wrote a book and during my dead time here the last month on software selections, I uh, wholeheartedly agree with you. You have to have a plan and you need to have a narrative in place uh, so that you do the right kind of job in uh, vetting out and acquiring the right technology. And then, you know, there may be companies, uh, excuse me, uh, that have, uh, that are going to come out of this fat, dumb, and happy and flush with cash 
And uh, they, too, need a plan because if they want to maintain whatever kind of lead they have on the market, uh, they need to have a real structure around it. So I'm agreeing with you. I'm just saying that we're going to have a we're going to have a range of customer situations out there and their particular economic circumstances are going to drive a number of the kind of decisions they have to make.